Now, welcome to our conversation today, which is uh, Monday the 6th of July, 2020. And today I'm talking to Ted Wilson. Ted grew up on the Swan, uh, worked in Midland, and also spent his later years in Bellevue. Good morning, Ted. Good morning, Don. Welcome to our conversation today. Can you start by telling me uh, when you were born and where you were born? I was born in August the 30th, 1925, at 30 Vine Street, North Perth. So uh, mum and dad, uh, obviously... Um, resided there and how long did you stay in North Perth? Well I don't really know that it was only until I was capable or my mother was capable of taking me back out to the Swan to MacDonald Road. Right uh, and, and can you describe to us where MacDonald Road is in the Swan? Well MacDonald Road if you go out Northern Highway at 6 k's from oh, 6 miles from Midland roughly and uh, we only had sand tracks and a horse and cart for transport. Was Great Northern Highway, was that a bitumen road? No, or? not in those days, it was all gravel. Just gravel? Yes. It, it would have felt like you were very isolated out there. We were isolated. I can remember out in front of the home was only sand tracks. Right. Uh, up to the where we used to go across the railway crossing there mm. from the middle of the line and you could turn left and go along the sand track towards the school or we used to walk along the line to school on the other side. Yeah, so uh, Mac yeah, McDonald Street ran off Great Northern Highway Yes, towards the hills. That's right, it joined the other end of Macdonald Street was uh, Lefroy Avenue. Right, that's as far as it went. Yeah, that's as far as Macdonald right. Road went. It was. And was the house, the house that mum and dad moved to, was that an established house or did dad have to build it? No, uh, in the early days uh, when they come out from England and pop married my mother in England mm. and came back out and brought her out to North Perth. Mm. Um, they stayed there for a while and he had this 24 acres or so out at Hearn Hill oh. alongside the middle of the line. Mm. And they went out there and cleared the blocks or cleared one block Mm. The road divided, McDonald Road divided the two blocks. Mm. One was all still bush up until, still is mm. um, big timber. Um, then they went out there and they built this two room weatherboard humpy, as I called it, mm. uh, and lived out there with us. And my father worked in Perth right. in the old treasury building as a clerk. He worked there for many years. He used to travel in by bus every day. Right. From from uh, what? From Great, Great Macdonald Road, yes. Right, there's a bus service there. There was a then. Mrs. Caisley's bus service used to run from Perth to Upper Swan. So this would have been the 1930s? Uh, yeah, even before that. I, I was out there before 1930. Right. So th that bus service that came in from Midland, yeah. did that go out as far as uh, Ballsbrook? Was Pierce Air Base established at that point? Do you know? uh, Pierce Air Base was only a small amount, I think, in those days. Mm. But the bus service used to finish at Upper Swan, just over the bridge and over the railway line there. Right. Um, Occasionally, they did run a bus to Bullsbrook. Right. Now, Mrs. Caisley sold out that to the Midland Railway Company. Right. Um, I can't remember the year, but she had 18 buses. And I can remember the first bus 
the Midland Railway Company built, they put in it number one. Yeah. And everybody screamed. Anyway, that was changed to 19 later on. Yeah. But uh, the Midland Railway Company, it was the bus service called the Beam Transport. Right. And uh, they used to run the buses and uh, they eventually started off buses to Geraldton. Right. So those mm. uh, those buses that uh, took your dad to work, mm. where would they have been? Where was their depot? Did they have a depot out at yeah, Upper Swan? At Upper Swan they had a depot. Right. Yes, yes. So, um, so Dad worked in town and Mum was just the housewife at home looking after... Looking after the us. growing kids. Yes, and also they'd planted the vineyard in this few years mm. and she used to do all that work in the vineyard. Mm. There's only one thing my mother didn't do and that was horse and plough. Right. There was no tractors in those days. Mm. But she used to do everything else. She pruned that whole vineyard. Incredible. And uh, did... Um where did Mum get her groceries from in those days? Right, the groceries, we used to get a delivery once a fortnight from the name of the chap in the shop was Hillary's Grocery Shop. There was Lettica's and then there was the Hillary's shop just a bit further down the other side of Fair Lawn. Is that going towards Midland? Going towards Midland. Around where well, Swan Settlers were? No, not as once it was as further down. Okay. Yeah. There was another shop down there then, um, which was the post office. Right. There was the three shops all told that mm. I can remember. This was like the Hearn Hill Settlement. Yeah. Well, it wasn't until later years that the Swan Settlers built the shop up on the Northern Highway. Right. That's only a recent thing, yeah. really. Yeah. Um, but... The groceries they used to deliver and when they delivered they'd take an order for the next fortnight. The um, bakery used to come round and give you fresh bread. We had to have a bread box down at Lefroy Avenue mm. and we'd walk a few yards down to get that each day. Was that delivered by truck? Uh, no, by horse and cart, baker's cart. Right. <laughs> and... Uh, Meet Arthur Domney in later years was our butcher and he he lived in Middle Swan right. uh, and he used to come round in a uh, horse and cart thing originally and then he, he got to a little Bedford van, mm. right, insulated van, all insulated mm. and he used to come round about uh, I think twice a week yeah. for meat and that. Mm. Uh, incidentally, that particular van, later on in years, I bought it. <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> but uh, other other uh, food stuffs, um, uh, well, we got everything through Hillary's, really, the grocery shop. Well, how did you keep things cold? How did Mum keep things cold? Well, we had no power in those days out there. Any telephone? No, no telephone, no power, no load on water. She used to have a cool guardy safe to keep things in. Can you describe that for us? Hmm? A cool guardy safe? Yeah, which which was a, a square safe with hashing down the sides right. and a water tray in the top hmm. and you draped um, a piece of flannel from the water tray over the sides. Hmm and that kept everything in there cool and we had an old well that we had for water um, which we used to drop butter and stuff in a bucket down that to keep that cool or any bottles of drink you wanted mm. we'd drop them down in the well in a bucket um, was, the, was the water drinkable? No Oh. No. How did you get your drinking water? Well, I don't know what we did for drinking water in the early stages. They must have carted it in. Mm. But I can remember later on, Alt Russell was his name. We got a thousand gallon water tank put in. 
<coughs> fresh water tank for the house alongside right, the house. Right, right, for rain for water. water. Right. And any, any other... I can remember 44-gallon drums, galvanised drums, were there also. They may use that for water, but they used to fill up with rainwater because water was very scarce out there. Mm. And as I say, no power. Mm. Um, that was... We got power on all oh, many years later. But for light, we had a big... Um, pressure lamp, kerosene pressure lamp with two big mantles on it. Right. And that, that was our light, it used to hang up in the room. One light? One light, yes. And what about in the bedrooms? What was there, lighting in the bedrooms? We didn't have any light in the bedrooms. There was only one bedroom what mum and dad had. Yeah. And then we used to sleep outside under a, a cool, um, under a bow shed uh, roof. E even in the winter time? Uh, in the winter time, we'd be brought inside and put in the kitchen and on the lounge and. Oh, you had there. a fireplace, obviously. To oh yeah, we had the fireplace, yeah, and a chimney and all that. Hmm. Was that separate from? They had a kitchen stove, obviously. No, that was that was it was a metal stove in in the one of those galvanised iron chimneys you used to yeah, see. Yeah. That was the stove, and the oven door used to come down flat. Right. It was a big oven, and that was our heating and e eating, cooking, everything. So the fire would have been going mm. 24 hours a day? Yeah, more or less, yeah, in, in the winter, yes. Where did you get your firewood from? Well, the other block, which we had, uh, there was any amount of timber on that. Yeah. Big jarret trees that were dead and fallen down Aye. over the years, and... We used to, when we were older, we used to use a big inch and a quarter auger mm. and drill down into these big lumps of wood. Yeah. And Pop would put a plug of jelly knot in, mm. then a fuse and um, lead and another plug of jelly knot on top of that and then tamp it down with sand or whatever and then light the fuse and get it out of the way and that would boom, and that would split all this log. <laughs> and then we would, we had a great big six foot hand saw, both mm. ends, a circular saw they mm. called, oh, not mm. circular, bow big, saw. big straight like saw. A bow saw. Well, as kids, we, we used to get on that and we used to cut our blocks up into wood. Mm. Amazing. And, and we, we'd use hammer and wedges then to split all the oh, so that was part of your, your part task of our around. Work. Yeah. Yeah. Was there much of a, a community spirit out there at Hearn Hill? Oh, well, yes. It was everyone knew everyone, of course. Yeah. But um, the hall, we used to have a dance every Saturday night in the old Hearn Hill Hall. And. Um, Where was that located, Tim? That was located about. Um, 300 yards from the school. Right, so right. We'll, we'll come to the school because yeah. um, right. you had to go to school somewhere. Can yeah. you, from your house in McDonald Street, can you describe where the school was? Is it near the present Hearn Hill School? Yes, it was alongside the present school as a one room asbestos room, and we're all in the one room, all classes, until later on in the years they built a double room, weatherboard and asbestos room with a, a little um, veranda on one end and put a couple of thousand gallon rainwater tanks in that for water for us. Mm. And we, I can remember we had a, a heater in there, one of the old um, heaters for the winter mm. to keep us warm. But of course that all went in later years. The headmaster's school went and uh, during war years, um, I think it was war years, the the old Hearn Hill Hall mm. was burnt down. Right. And the present school is now around the corner from right. where the old school is. Was there, did you play much sport in those days? Well, 
Yes, the oval was there alongside the hall. Right. Uh, pretty rough oval, but they used to play football there and everything that went on, mm. cricket, and mm. all that sort of thing. So, so we you had, would, had a fair bit of sport. Yeah. You would have played teams from the Midland area? Uh, yes, and Upper Swan. There was a school at Upper Swan mm. um, just before the present bridge. Was there much of a... a, a what size community was there in Upper Swan in those years, do you remember? Oh, fairly spread out. A lot of them were vineyards mm. and they'd be oh, a fair way apart. Mm. There wouldn't have been that many people lived out there. Were they, uh, the, the vineyards, were they operated by like people that came from other countries, immigrants? Uh, yes, a lot of Yugoslavs. Yeah. All our friends, like Leticus, they had a vineyard. Yeah. And Sokol's down near us, and oh, there's a lot of people had vineyards, mm. and a lot of them were uh, foreigners to us in those days. Yeah. But they were all, they all hopped in, right, as good people. And one thing we used to notice with the Yugoslavs, when their current crop was due, mm. they'd all swarm under one property and mm. pick that right throughout and have it picked in no time. Mm. Then they'd go to the next property. And do a real community thing, wasn't it? A community set up. And where did they send their grapes to? Well, uh, you dried all your, your currants. Oh, the currants, yeah. On, on big racks. Yep. Right, oh, well then, I can remember us having the racks when we had currants there. And that big lamp I was talking to you, that used to come outside. Mm at night and we used to rub the currants off through the racks onto hessian on the ground mm. and then they'd be put into kerosene box what we used to call kerosene boxes mm -hmm. it would take two kerosene tins mm. right and then that was taken as one settlers and graded right so that was a co-op that was developed that swan, amongst swan settlers co-op yeah yeah. Developed by the community members. Yeah, more of it, yeah. yeah to, to sell their products. Yeah. Mm. Well, they, they used to sell it all for us. But then grapes, a lot of people grew wine grapes. Mm. And I can remember most, we, we grew sultanas and um, muskets. Mm. And we, we used to make uh, raisins out of muskets. And what mum used to do all this, we built up a big stone fireplace and put a 12-gallon copper in it with a chimney up the back and a fire underneath it. Mm. And Mum used to also use that for a washing. We used to boil the water up in that. And as far as raisins went, we'd boil the water up and we had a, a wire basket that we used to fill with muskets and they would be dipped into this water which I think was had about roughly a pound of Cossack soda in it for a couple of seconds mm. and then put them out on the rack to dry mm. and they came out as raisins. So it was mainly dried fruits that they were producing. Oh, yeah. Was yeah. there much wine making in those days? Oh, yeah, yeah, quite a bit of wine making. Uh, there was no ex wines up at Upper Swan. Mm. Uh, Leticus made a fair bit of wine, mm. but I can remember Leticus where they used to crush their wine with their feet. Oh. <laughs> and. Um, Later on, they got presses and this sort of thing. Yeah. But there was a little winery near Vine Street in Hearn Hill there. Mm. Um, they, they were one of the first ones out there. This is apart from the big one like Ferguson's winery, Horton's. Were they established when you were when you were there? What Horton's? Horton's McF yeah, they oh, were they were established. Horton's established in nineteen. Um, Twenty. Um, oh. oh, well, when when the first uh, eighteen twenty nine. Yeah, right. So, so, that so, the, so the the grape growers would have been selling their. They their used to sell grapes to them. To, yes. to them to make wine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
so if I could just take you back to your schooling days, mm -hmm. you were in this classroom, mm -hmm. um, one class, one room, with one teacher. No, there was about six, six uh, different classes. Right. M with one teacher, yes. Yeah. There were, so. Six, six different grades in the yeah. one classroom. Yeah. So the one teacher yeah. was teaching a lot. Amazing. Yeah. Mm. How many kids would have been in your? Oh, well, well, the the kids wouldn't have wouldn't have been that many. There would have only been about thirty or forty kids at all time. Oh, still, yeah. they would have been pretty busy. <laughs> yeah. So you have sports days and stuff like oh, that? Oh yeah, we had our sports days oh, yeah. and all that with the different uh, schools mm. and uh, Middle Swan School, the orphanage at Middle Swan. Swan Lee. Swan Lee, yeah, we used to um, have. And how did you get around? Uh, did you did you go on excursions very much? Oh well, we, we, it was mainly uh, a bus they had organised to take right. us to right. school, to these outings and that. Mm. There was no railway station on the Midland Railway Company line at home. Yeah, the, at Swan Settlers there was um, a railway station. Uh, Upper Swan had the next railway station. Right. Um, I can remember my father even catching the express from Gelton at one of them because they used to stop for you if you were on the platform oh, yeah. and take you into Perth right. or into Midland and then you'd yeah. grab the local train to Perth. I wonder how often those trains ran. The Jelton Express ran uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays. Oh. And what time would, would come through in the early morning going towards Ra round, round about, no, um, well, the morning train used to come down from Jelton would have been about, oh, about 9 o'clock roughly. Mm. Mm. Because we used to, if we were walking along the line to go to school, occasionally the train would be coming. So we'd get off the track. Yeah. But they used to move along, uh, a cloud of dust behind them, Didn't and they? They, were, they had two big American engines yeah. with the big wheels on them. You could see right through them. Oh, they yeah. weren't all enclosed. Mm. They just had the big round uh, mm. boiler. Mm. And do you remember what sort of carriages they had in those days? That oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They had the ordinary passenger carriages. With the, and the dog box type. Yeah, thing. dog box type, yeah. yeah. But some of, some of them, it's like the local WIJR, they had a pass, um, an aisleway along the sides. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah. So you, you go through to what year? When did your schooling finish at Hearn Hill? My schooling what standard finished at did Hearn you finish Hill, at? hang on, 90, 40. Uh, 19, 38, uh, 37. I, w I would have left Hearn Hill when the sixth standard was there in 1936. Right. And that's, I spent 1937 a year at North Perth State School. Mm -hmm. And then the next two years I spent at Junior Tech School in West Perth in Newcastle Street. So you would have finished off in like uh, grade ten or something. Oh uh, well, something of that standard. Six, um, uh, right, or I don't know whether we didn't class them as grades here. No. I don't think. No, it's, it was it was Not different. Not junior tech. It was yeah. just. A, so how old were you? How old were you when you completed your like schooling before you went to the technical college? Do you reckon fifteen, sixteen? No, well, when, when I finished um, Junior Tech, um, that was December 1940. That oh, right. And You've I'd had 15. two years there, mm. see? Mm. So that would have been 37 or around mm. about 37 at North Perth State School. Mm. And then I, I did the two years of Junior Tech, mm. and then I went from Junior Tech to the um, main tech in St George's Terrace. Mm. So your you, schooling continues and you're learning these technical trades yeah. and then uh, the war comes. <laughs> Do you remember when war broke out? Uh, 1940, uh, 1939, 39. I think, was yeah. the actual start of it. Yeah. So were there restrictions placed on 
daily life then for <laughs> you? Yeah, I can remember the headlights on the cars had uh, a sheet of metal and they had a slot in it and, and a little hood over it. And they were headlight protectors. Mm. Uh, we had a rationing for sugar, petrol. Um, what else did we have rationing on? Sugar and petrol and... Oh, I can't think of... Other oh, foodstuffs in here. In the foodstuffs, yeah. Yes. so it got life got tougher. Oh, it got tough, yes. Yeah. Yes. Mm. And uh, did you sort of uh, have any inclination to en en enlist? Well, yes, yes, because both my brothers were, were already in. Mm. What were they in? Brothers. What force were they in? Well, the eldest brother was in the 10th Armoured Div in the tanks, mm. and the next brother, one above me, was in the Navy. Right. And uh, I wanted to get into the tanks with the brother, and mm. my father said, no way in the world are two sons of mine going in the same unit. Of mm. course, he was in both wars. He was in the First World War. First War, yeah, and Second War. I've got a write-up, right a good write-up of him. He finished up as a colonel in the Second War, mm. and he used to be CO of a lot of the um, garrison battalions. In In, in the Second War, yeah, in WA. Yeah. And also in charge of one section, all the Norwest. Mm. Um, so just briefly, where, where did he serve in the First World War? Oh, well, the first of when he left Fremantle in a ship, they were heading towards uh, Gallipoli. Right. Well, when they got over near the Middle East, and of course Gallipoli was, you know, coming good. to an end. So he finished up going to Egypt, Belgium, France, mm. all through the Middle East. Mm. He was in there. I've, I've got a write-up. It's very interesting for you to read. It's the history of my father mm -hmm. and all his life. And, of course, he was a, a boy, the first Boy Scout in WA. Mm. And he finished up as Commissioner of Boy Scouts mm. in WA for seven years. Uh, that was when uh, Sir um, Charlie Gardner oh, yeah. was the governor. Right. But he had a crook leg, mm. apparently, and he couldn't do the job. Oh, yeah. So my father, for seven years, did that job as Commissioner oh. of Boy Scouts. So you had you had the military in your in your system. So. What part did you play in the military? Well, I was in the Air Force. But right, I, so, yeah, I, so can you tell me, um, you know, from the outbreak of war, from your technical training, and well, what, yeah, what, well, when, you, from, when you joined the Air Force? No, well, just before I joined the Air Force, when I left um, um, the tech at Newcastle Street in West Perth, I went to the... Mines Tech School in St George's Terrace and I was there for a few months and one of the instructors come along to me and one day and he said, oh, would you like a job? And I said, oh, yeah, money. Mm. <laughs> See? And I said, where and what? He says that George Hill's brass foundry in Nash Street in East Perth. And I said, what doing? He said, well, he said, I can take you out there and you'll be looking after a great big automatic lathe on shift work with another chap. Ten-hour shifts. Hmm. Oh, I thought, yeah. So what this lathe was doing, we had brass rods about one and a quarter inch diameter, ten foot long. And this automatic lathe, George Hill had built that himself. And we used to push these rods in, and they were turning out caps for a six-inch shell. Oh, yeah. All the threads, all these automatic things came in and did all their jobs, 
and about every ten one that finished and dropped into the bucket there, you had to gauge all these things to make sure they were all still, you know, within measurements. And what did they do with them? What did they do with them? What was their end use? What was their end use for mm. six-inch six shells? Oh, right. They had threads that they screwed into, they were a cap okay. for a six-inch shell. Gotcha, yeah. Right? Mm. Well, I was there for all oh, quite a while, and uh, I worked a shift with another chap, but he, he was older than me, because I was still only in me, you know, mm. early, late teens then, mm. and um, I used to have arguments with him. He said to me one day, he said, oh, he said, ease up, will you? He said, you, you're doing too many. I said, what do you mean doing too many? I said, I, I can't alter the speed of the lathe. Mm. And I, I was turning out so many more than what he was, mm. and, you know, a shift. What he did, he evidently sat down his bum and did nothing. Mm. And I wasn't very happy with him. Right? So um, anyway, I turned just on 18 then, and I thought, oh, I've got to get out of here mm. because they're going to manpower us. Mm. Right? Mm. So I got out and went back to the vineyard at Hearn Hill for a while. Mm-hmm. And joined the Air Force. So I I had I had two years in the Air Training Corps. Where did you join? Where did you enlist? In in Perth. Okay. Yeah. Now where whereabouts in Perth was that? Do you remember? Oh, where the hell was it? Over near the museum. I'm not sure. It doesn't matter. You're in the Air Force anyhow. Yeah, I joined the Air Force there anyway. Yeah. And um, I went back to Perth Tech then Mm. to five... We were camped at 5STT down in Mount Spay Road, uh, just the other side of where the tech school was, Mm. right, and WA newspapers and that. Mm. And we used to go across there and do our courses. Mm. And of course, I was I was mechanically minded right through, and I, I wanted to get in as a fitter to E, mm. which was an aircraft mechanic, mm. and went through all the exams and I had top marks mm. as a mechanic, you know, mm. in my exams, and I was horrified. They had chaps with lower marks than me put in as fitter to ease mm. and they sent me to Melbourne Tech to do an electrician's course. Right. Not happy? Oh, I wasn't happy at all. Mm. I spent three months at Melbourne Tech. We used to be camped in exhibition buildings in Melbourne, if you know it. No. Right up the top of Burke Street, a big, great big building. Oh, I, I understand. Yeah, that was where the first parliament was, I think. Uh, like it could have been, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. But the Air Force was, um, I come back from there and I was posted to, um, I went in finally when I didn't want that, I took an equipment course, right? And I went to Adelaide for three weeks and then back to Melbourne. Mm. I was camped at Ascot Vale race course in Melbourne for a few or oh, must be nearly a month and uh, camped there but after the first night I uh, I wasn't very happy mm. I'd see all these boys in the camp working at that go out at five o'clock at night flash their pass walk through catch a tram in home and come back in the morning Seven o'clock, eight o'clock, flash their past in. And I said, oh, geez. I said, this is no good. So what I did, I used to walk to the mob, flash me pass, which I didn't have an outdoor pass. I was supposed to be camped in the property. Mm. And the first thing I did when I got to Melbourne, I'd go and book myself a bed in the YMCA hut, mm. right? I'd get up in the morning and catch the tram out again. 
Mm. Walk through the gate, flash me past. Mm. I did that the whole time I was there. Mm. Eh? Because I didn't want to live in the camp there. Oh, yeah. How did you travel between the west and the east in, in those days? Well, my first trip east in the Air Force, uh, we went to Kalgoorlie in the Kalgoorlie... Uh, Westland. Yeah, in those days. And we went out to um, the um, terminal there, the lab? Or Parkston? Hmm? Parkston? Parkston, something, yeah. Mm. Right there. We went from there to Adelaide in cattle trucks. Mm. All right? Uh, we had a toy. Oh, open open mm. wagons, uh, yeah. like with slats we, along the side. Yeah, we, we had a toilet. Open toilet in one end, right? What is that, just a hole, hole in the bottom of the... Cabin? No, it was a toilet with a hole through to the bottom, yeah. Oh, OK. Uh, we had straw on the floor to sleep on. Um, we broke down a tar cooler. The engine broke down a tar cooler. And there was heaps of old sleepers on the side of the road that had been replaced. Mm. And it was freezing cold. Mm. So we set fire to one of these heaps of sleepers <laughs> to keep warm, yeah. all right? Maybe. And we finished up getting back to um, Port Piri, I think, was the uh, terminal then. Mm. And then from Port Piri to Melbourne, we went in a passenger train. Mm. So at, at war's end, uh, you stayed in the Air Force, or did you...? Did you well, when war finished, I was still in Derby. In '45, right. um, Derby Airstrip, we were camped at, and uh, I, I wound the camp up there, and that's what I was saying. Me I had to burn all our equipment, mm. which was terrible, really. Mm. Burning tents, perfectly good tents, uh, trestle tables, and seats, mm. and that was where I ran into trouble with these masonite huts, mm. which I. Uh, Finally gave to the uh, native hospital in Derby mm. and got into trouble for that mm. because I'd signed vouchers that I'd burnt them. Mm. But they wanted them right or left. Right. They were something they, you know, couldn't get. Yeah. So at the, at the, at the end of the war, you uh, were in Derby and then when did you get back into the Midland area? Well, when when I when I left Derby, uh, we drove uh, the old refueler truck through to Broome, which was only a sand track in those days. An old Langey crossing was just one wooden bridge across the Fitzroy River. No rails, nothing, just mm. a wooden bridge about mm. 12 foot wide. And uh, from there, I uh, I flew back to. Uh, I, I did fly back to Pierce there, mm. uh, but I was on leave for six weeks mm -hmm. in that period because I had a little leave up my sleeve. Mm -hmm. um, then while I was stationed at Pierce, I was transferred to uh, Dunreath, which is now Guildford Airport. I spent the rest of my time from the end of the war till no, uh, March 1946 at Guildford. You, you were living there, were you? No, I lived home then. This is the, I, on, the, on the Swan? Yeah, I lived home at MacDonald Road then yeah. um, until uh, I was discharged, but I used to go to work on a motorbike mm. to the Guildford each day. Mm. Um, 1946, I was discharged and got out of that. Right. But I couldn't see any future for me in the Air Force no. at the time. So time passes and uh, you eventually came to live in Bellevue. Well, in the, in the meantime, I'd met my wife. Mm. Right? And uh, where, where did you meet? In the Madalena Hotel. Madalena Hotel. She was a cook there. 
Go on. But she was 10 years older than me. Mm. And a very, very lovely girl. Mm. And we were married for 58 years. Go on. And uh, we used to, Oh, well, it gets back to yeah. later on. L living in Bellevue? Uh, no, not then. No. We were living in Shinton Park. And right. Until we bought this old place in Bellevue. What street was that? Hackett Street. Right. Just up over the railway crossing. Right. Um, Gravel Road was then, in those days. This place we bought was an old uh, corrugated and asbestos house, which was built, I look back, if I tried to find out, about 1914. Mm. And we lived in that for 11 years, right? And mm. our address was number 13. Mm. Um, but in this time, we were both ex-service, mm. and I didn't know, and nobody told you these things, but I was due for a war service loan to build a house. Mm -hmm. All right. And when we bought this old place, it had two blocks. Mm. One was full of fruit trees mm. and a windmill and a well, right? And we had the other block of the old house on. Mm. So I finished up with two blocks of land. Mm. Okay. And when I found out that we were entitled to war service home, I applied. Then they knocked me back because I already owned an old house mm. and they had a big confab and they said we can do it on a what they call a bridging finance or something. Mm. And I had to sell that house before I could get me a loan. Mm. And that was 1962. Mm. Right? So we built our new house on the other block, pulled out a few fruit trees mm. and all that. Um, and we moved, we moved into that house in 1962, a brick and tiled three bedroom house. And we, of course we had three kids by then. Mm. You see? Uh, what sort of work were you doing at that time? Well, at that time, I, uh, when I I got out of the Air Force, I, I went to this engineering company on intercom phones. I stuck with them for 18 months or more and finally finished up joining the PMG in 1948. What did that stand for? Postmaster General's Department. Right. And in the meantime, we got this money from my wife's auntie. She gave us money to build a house, and mm. we had one daughter by then. Mm. And uh, we couldn't see much around. There was this old house going for the 1500 that she'd lent us. Oh, we bought it. Mm. And that's how I started. But getting back to the Swan. That was 1951 when we went there, mm. and I, w I was working in Perth then, in the PMG, and travelling by train every day from Bellevue, mm. which was a waste of time to me, mm. and I asked for a, a move closer to home, and they posted me to Guildford Town Hall, which was the not the Guildford, the Guildford Post Office, mm -hmm. which was the telephone exchange and old cord board there oh, yeah. in the old post office where the clock is. Right. And then before I ever got there, they turned around and changed it and posted me to Midland. Okay. Mm. And I found out later on in years, Jimmy Marshall, now you may have known him, he, he was the... Um, Officer, of, Chief Officer of Midland Exchange, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and he was an army chap under my father. Oh. See, and I think there was some mm. words went on there. Mm. Anyway, I went to Midland um, in 1951, 
Midland Exchange in Morrison Road. Opposite Midland Oval. That's right. And I stayed there for 29 years until I retired in 1980. And I, I retired five years earlier. I got out at 55, um, more or less medically unfit with a bundle of nerves. Mm. All right? Mm. And the reason for that was I shouldn't have stayed there so long. Mm. Because everything out. was pushed onto me. A bit burnt out. We had quite a few different supervisors. And I tell you, some of them weren't the best. Mm. In fact, one of them in particular, when the mail came out, it was handed to me. Mm. <laughs> but um, it was a, a good job up until, oh, about 19, 1972. Uh, we used to work shift work there, mm. and the riffraff started to come in. Mm. They got in that didn't want to work. Mm. So. And this annoyed me a bit because the two chaps, supervisors, and the chap I used to tech that I used to work with, the four of us, we used to do the shifts. Mm. Uh, and we, the other tech and me, we used to swap shift every uh, six weeks. So we changed supervisors mm. instead of stopping with the same one all the time. Mm. They were both good, good first class chaps mm. really good mm. but it was just a matter of a bit of a change yeah. and they agreed with it and uh, I got that way that I was on recall for two oh, years and years 15 years or more mm. getting out of bed at all hours of the night mm. for recall for faults and all that and there's three three of us recall and I was number one Mm. Right, because I got all the lousy hours from midnight onwards. This went on for quite a few years, and I, I was getting that way. I was a bundle of nerves. Mm. So. So, so the the work you were doing in the exchange itself was, was that sort of technical work, hooking up wires, or oh you no, well it did? was look, looking after all automatic switches mainly. Okay. See, they had to be serviced and uh, mm. uh, batteries and all that sort of thing. Mm. Um, the automatic switches had to be oiled every so often oh, okay. and all that sort of thing. They, they were called what they call the 2000 type switch. Mm. Um, that was up until the new stuff came in. But uh, then we had Green Man Exchange later on years. Mm was the same, was automatic. Mm. We had Hearn Hill to look after as an exchange, mm. which the Hearn Hill exchange worked on old 1914 plunger stuff from Central Exchange in Murray Street. Mm. And then we had cord boards we used to look after Chittering, Lower Chittering, mm. uh, Bullsbrook, we used to look after Pierce had an automatic exchange upstairs over the entrance. Mm. Um, then we had, later on, we had Bullsbrook cord board down where the railway line is, which used to be Bullsbrook. Mm. And then later on in years, they built a new exchange up behind Checkers Hotel, oh, yeah. an automatic. So these were all places we had to look after. Mm. One Dowie. Mm. was our furthest out that way. So Midland was the main... Midland was our main yeah, headquarters. I but if I, I got called out, see, we used to have what they called urgent services, like doctors and mm. uh, anyone, you know, that was urgent. Mm. It was an urgent service and you had to go and oh. attend to it and they wouldn't let them go till the next day. Mm. Did you go and do household calls? Oh, yeah, yeah quite mm. a lot. Quite a lot. Now, I'll quote you one. It was a Sunday night. It was blowing a strong easterly, and they up in the hills area, Chillows, and that there was fires everywhere. And we got a call out to go out to a phone that was out of order. Uh, Lily, Lilydale Road, out of 
she lays there. Mm. And it was all open wire stuff, of course, then. Mm. There was no cables. And I went to the exchange, sure enough, it was out from the exchange. And I took my wife with me at the time, and I didn't go into Midland to pick up the vehicle. Mm. I used my own car because by the time I went into Midland from where we were, opened up and got their vehicle out and put mm. mine in, it was time. Mm. So I used to take my own vehicle quite often to save time. Mm. And anyway, we drove out through this little uh, road with a torch looking at wires, mm. right? Because it was a loop, a short circuit. Mm. And uh, mostly it was a strong wind and I thought, oh, well, they're going to be looped up together in the wind. Mm. We got that far that we run out of wire and they started to cut across the private property mm. from the roadway. So we went up to the house then and uh, sure enough it was back towards the exchange. Mm. So the wife and I started to walk through the bush to the with a torch following these lines. Yeah. And about three or four bays out from the house, sure enough, it was looped up. All oh, right. So, what we used to do then was grab a lump of wood, mm. and I found a decent lump of wood about so long, mm. and we would throw that up at the line. Try and get them apart. Yeah. My third attempt, I knocked them apart. <laughs> and we went back to the house, and sure enough, we were back on the air. So I told the lady there, you know, what had happened and mm. I said, I'll put it in so that tomorrow morning, Monday morning, I'll get them to come and tighten up those lines because oh, yeah. they were sloppy, yeah. see. But that was one episode. Um, I, uh, Getting back to the middle of the exchange building there, yeah. I grew up just around the corner in North Street and yeah. during the night I'd always hear this motor going. We'd cut in and cut out. Do you know the motor I'm talking about? It was like, must have been a generator of some kind. With uh, it would exhaust. have been the air conditioner, I think. Was it? Yeah, big oh. air conditioner motor. Oh. Yeah. yeah. Because the, the other, um, we had a, initially we had a big three-cylinder Hornsby uh, diesel uh, as an emergency electrical plant mm. for a 30 kVA plant. Mm. Well, that used to cause a lot of trouble. It was a hand crank on it. Mm. And you had to be doing 120 revs mm. to knock the exhaust valve up and start it. Mm. And it was, you had to get that crank handle off mm. when it started. Oh, right. And sometimes, spinning. Sometimes you couldn't get it off. Mm. That happened three times. Mm. And on the handle, there was a a piece of pipe about that long, like water pipe, mm. with a washer and a split pin on the end mm. of the mm. handle. Mm. And that used to straighten that bar, shear the split pin off mm. with the revs, mm. and that piece of metal flew around the room. Yeah. <laughs> so when that happened, you got out quick. Yeah. See? Yeah. So once that happened, you could get around the back of the motor and turn it off. Mm. Anyway, that, that was one of the bad things about that. But then we got a, a six-cylinder Perkins diesel in place of that. Mm. Okay. And that was a different story. More modern equipment. Yeah, more modern equipment. Um, if I can uh, finish off our discussion today, our, our conversation, by uh, talking briefly about uh, living in Bellevue mm. and a social life in Bellevue, in those in those fifties and sixties, well, most of our social life was tied up with the school, right? Because we were both P and C adverts, and uh, which school was this? K uh, Kungamaya School. Oh, okay. Uh, Bellevue School closed down in nineteen fifty six, right? And my eldest daughter, she started at Bellevue. And halfway through the year, they opened Coongamire and closed Bellevue down. Right. Well, she had to then go to Coongamire. She would have walked to school, no doubt. Yeah, both 
both girls she could yeah. walk yeah and the same t-shirt was a Bellevue went with them to Kunkamaya right. they and Miss Brown right uh, but as far as social life we used to run um, well for quite a few years before 1966 I used to run the picture theatre at the school Oh, right. uh, a Saturday afternoon matinee for the kids, mm. which we had a double rooms and it had a concertina um, wall, shuttle wall. Mm. Well, we could open that up and we put two holes mm. down the end of the room, which on the end was a, um, a library room. Mm. And I had two projectors. And we used to have these projectors that shone through these holes mm. onto the screen down the far end. Mm. And that was closed off all the blinds and it was pretty dark there during the day. And that's how we run the kid the kids matinee. Every what once a week? Oh yeah, once a week, yeah. Sat Saturday afternoon. Yeah. And then on a Wednesday night we run uh, pictures for the uh, adults. Right, a yeah. Wednesday night. Yeah. But this is pre-television days, wasn't it? Yeah, well, see, this is what busted us up. Television come in and people didn't want to come to the... Pictures. Pictures. Mm. See? But then on the adults' night, we used to show them from a different room through louvers mm. and we used to put up a big screen out in the yard. Mm. 4x4, four 4x2 four, uh, four uprights. We yeah, used to outdoor use outdoor picture theatre. With ropes. And, yeah, an outdoor. And we used to cart all the chairs out of the rooms for the adults to sit on. This is at the Coongamaya Primary at School. At the Coongamaya Primary School. Oh. And we, my wife and one of the other women, they used to go down to Playstows and we used to run a shop. Hmm with lollies and all sorts of things. Mm. And the government clamped down on us. We've got to pay tax if we're going to do these sort of things. Mm. Making you know. a profit. And we, we, we had to turn around. We had to supply a cup of tea and bickies to get out of paying tax. So the women organised all this, mm. did all this for us. Mm. And uh, as I say, it finally packed up when television come in. Mm. But then again, we had a good school headmaster at the time there. Mm. Uh, it was when the government were handing out pianos to the country schools. Mm. And for some reason, they classed Coongamaya as country. Mm. And he got a, a free piano for the school. Mm. <laughs> But we had to do a lot of work there. We, we the oval, the oval we uh, cleared, mm. and the government wouldn't pay for us to get sand for it. Mm. We we did that ourselves. Mm. Got like truckloads of sand into Build it up. all the oval. Well, and Christmas time, I'd go out to Nangara Pine Plantation and get Christmas trees, mm. a big Christmas tree, me trailer, we take that over. And all the um, kids that went to school got a, a prize or a present for Christmas. Mm. Now how we did this, bones were on in those days in mm. Perth. We used to give a list of bones of all the kids their age, female or male, and they would sort out a, a present for their age and everything, and they lived them to my house mm. in Hackett Street. They were donated? No, not fully donated. We paid so much. Mm. But anything we didn't get rid of, Bones took back. Oh, yeah. But. We even included, my wife used to go around in Bellevue, there's a lot of Polish people in me that came out in 1950-odd. Mm. And some of them had young kids that weren't school age. 
and all these kids were included in the Christmas tree. Mm. And I think I had to pay five, five, five pound each. I think it was, mm. Mm. or five, five shillings each, mm. something like that. Wasn't a lot. And these women said, "Oh, they couldn't afford it. They couldn't uh, do mm. that." So the PNC, every kid that wasn't a school kid or underage, the PNC paid for, mm. and they, all those kids got their prize, their present. Mm. Well. I think we'll close it off there. Yeah. I've had a fascinating time listening to your life's experience yeah. and the changes that you've actually seen. Oh. Uh, young people today would have to truly appreciate how tough it yeah. was back look, in those early look, days. When I first moved into that old place at Bellevue, we didn't even have a chair. Mm. We sat on kerosene boxes oh. and I bought an old kitchen table Mm. I wouldn't buy anything on time payment mm. because it cost too much in those days. So I mm. used to bump the interest up. Mm. Yeah. Well, but well, get, getting back to Midland Exchange, one, one of the highlights of my time in Midland was in 1962 also, was when John Glenn went round the universe. Oh, yeah. Right. I was full time at Mushay Tracking Station that oh. whole time. Oh, right. And I was there the night he went round listening to him. Oh, yeah. And we, we had a frightening thing for about two minutes. We lost contact with him. Oh, yeah. And it was to do with radio waves, apparently, when he was coming down. Mm hmm But we got back to him. Mm. But um, Someone that, from the station was actually talking, communicating with him. One on one. Oh yeah, yeah. We had yeah. We were responsible for communication from Perth to Sydney, right? Right. And um, we kept that line open all the time. Mm. We didn't have a because in, in our early days with our experimentation and that, we used to have to make a call to Sydney, yeah. and sometimes you couldn't get through to Sydney. Mm. See. Because they were only railway lines then, mm. no um, no broadband. It was mm. three channel carrier systems, right. and things like this. That you know, we had uh, alternative. We had another route from Mushay to Mora and back to Two J, mm. and that in case someone knocked a pole over. Right. So you had to be prepared for these things, mm. but. Yeah, I'm supposed I'm holding you up. No, but, well, but another another big thing happened in 1956 in Midland Exchange, in Morrison Road. Um, there was a, a fire hydrant outside the exchange, right? Mm. And of course, someone knocked it over. The water and went. there was water went up, oh, and over like that mm. onto the roof of the exchange. Mm. And we had a big battery room, and all our batteries mm. were, I don't know whether you've seen the exchange battery, they were big glass batteries that mm. high, and like this. Uh, we had two banks of 24 volt, uh, 50 volt batteries, mm. and we had two more banks, one of 24 for the, uh, filament of the valves on all the carrier stuff and another 130 volt batteries for the plates on the valves. Well the water would come down, our gutters couldn't take it, it come mm. through the roof mm. and it was coming down into our open cell batteries. Mm. Okay. Oh quick there were screams, get some tarps. Mm. So out the shed we get, raced out, got tarps and put over the top of our batteries. Mm. And anyway, that stopped the water running into our batteries. Saved the day. And we went outside, and of course, this was still pouring over the roof, mm. and the boss went in, and he said, back the van over it. Mm. We had a new 1956 hole and panel van, and we backed that over this hydrant. Mm. Stopped, stopped it. Stopped it. Amazing. Yeah. Right, we'll finish it there. Thanks ah. very much again for your time, Ted. I've uh, really enjoyed our chat today. 
Yeah, oh, well, I, I've got lots of things that I could show you, but I, yeah, I don't know if you'd be very interested in a lot of them. We're interested in all of it. I'm just going to finish it there. Thanks very much for your time. Oh, okay, well, thanks a lot uh, for your effort.